this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 40. Genesis chapter 40. We went into Genesis 40 last Sunday. We didn't get that far, but there was a doctrine that we all need to be remembered of, and that is when we do something, we do it as unto the Lord. And we depend upon Him in all things, and Joseph is a good description of that. We'll start with verse 1 in Genesis chapter 40. Well, let me give you a little more background. Um, of course, Joseph was unfairly, unjustly thrown into prison, and the Lord was with him, whatever he did, and the Lord made him to prosper, the grace of God. Then in verse 1, then it came about after these things that the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And I told you last Sunday that the king of Egypt is a synonym for Pharaoh. For uh, Pharaoh, his name means the ruler of the house. Verse 2, and Pharaoh was furious with these two officials the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. So he put them into confinement in the house which was on Potiphar's, in his, on his land and probably adjacent to the house. And, and the captain of the bodyguard, which was Potiphar, uh, in the jail, the same place where Joseph was, Imprisoned. This was not a coincidence. In fact, I'm, I, I'm at the point nearly where I can say I don't believe there are any coincidences. And so when somebody says, oh, well, that was a coincidence, you can just grin or else you can pull up your uh, pulpit and start preaching to them. It's just whatever you want to do. Point four. And the captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them, and he took care of them and they were in confinement for some time. Now, I don't remember if I told you to underline the phrase, he took care of them. He did have authority over them, but these were very important people, and essentially Potiphar told him to serve them, to be their servant. And that would be hard for most people because they were there deservedly. He was not, and yet he was to serve them. And I don't know if these men were pompous, if they were uh, aloof. Most people in those positions are. So that would make it even harder for him to obey his command to serve them, but we need to take note that that's what he was doing. The Hebrew word there for care, took care, in the Hebrew is sheret, S-H-E-R-E-T. Verse 5, then the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt had a uh, who was confined in jail, in the same jail as Joseph, each man with his own dream, and each dream with his own interpretation. Now, I would point out to you that this was not a coincidence, that they both had a dream, not the same dream, but independent dreams on the same night. 
That doesn't happen very often. And it's not a coincidence because God was orchestrating all of this. He always does. And sometimes it dawns on us when something looks like, well, isn't that a coincidence? Well, it's not. It's God always is behind the scenes working in the life of his believers and doing things for which they are unaware. But just because you think in your mind that God hasn't noticed you lately, some people even get to the point to where they think, well, he's just forgot about me. That never happens. So we go to verse 6. When Je Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them, behold, they were dejected. Now, this doesn't seem like a big major verse, but it does tell us something. That Joseph really cared about those who were under his responsibility. I talk to Rowdy nearly every day. He's the, the prisoner in prison that was unjustly imprisoned. And he sometimes tell me, tells me about the guards. And the last thing that they are concerned with or even notice is the prisoners. He worked for the supply uh, part of when people... Uh, that people would go into another part of the prison. In fact, it's, it's kind of strange. They're in prison, but th when they really mess up, then they go to jail. And going to jail is when they take them and put them in a solitary confinement. And so he says, uh, uh, they hold the, uh, the, the people's, the prisoners' uh, things, you know, their belongings, so nobody will steal them. He, he worked there. And so he... He went to work. By the way, they all have jobs. He told me yesterday they still have chain gangs in Florida. I mean, where they literally chain each other up. And that, of course, we started talking about Cool Hand Luke. But anyway, um, to show you how much they care about their um, people, the prisoners, he had to uh, be at work and I think it was 8 o'clock. And he had to walk, I don't know how far it was, and he had to wait an hour for the guard to get there because he never was on time. And he could have, the, the guard could very easily just change the time to where he wouldn't have to wait. I don't remember why he couldn't go there at that particular But anyway, he had to wait. And they are not concerned. And when we think about it in, on the outside, there's not many people who are really concerned about their employees. Some are really great about it. They, they're like family. But others, they just dismiss them. They don't think about them. So when you have Joseph come in he, and he looks at them and he says, He observed them, and behold, they were dejected. Now, he has to be paying attention. He has to know them in order to understand what's the matter today. And the fact that he even mentioned that, that he cared enough, says a lot about who he is. And it's usually to show compassion and concern about someone uh, in just everyday circumstances is, is I wouldn't say it's rare, but it's not necessarily the norm. But when you have people that are, were probably aloof, they were there because they had to be there, I mean, because they were guilty, but here you have Joseph there because it was unjust, you very easily could have said, well, I don't care about these guys. I'm the one that should have the pity. I'm the one that people should be uh, going to bad far. I don't care about these people. They deserve it. That's human viewpoint. 
In other words, stinking thinking. And the bad part about it with us is that we don't have to sit down and come up that, with that in our mind at any given time. It just is there. When you have a mental attitude sin and you weren't really, it's not that you hate somebody, all of a sudden, bam! It's just like a, something hits you out of, out of the blue. And there is this very caustic and stinky mental attitude sin. And you didn't ask for it. It's just there. Now, don't y'all look at me so uh, sancti sanctified. I know that that happens to you as well. And the reason I know for two reasons. Number one, you're breathing. And number two, you're human. But not Joseph. You see, his core character was one of caring. He had great capacity to love other people. So even though that's an innocuous verse, it says that he noticed that their, their faces were sad today and he was concerned about them. Verse 7. And he asked Pharaoh's officials who were with him in confinement And he asked the Pharaoh's officials who were with him in confinement in the master's house, why are your faces sad today? Not only does he notice it, he wants to know what's going on in your life. Again, we have this unusual, he's, he was essentially a prison guard, but he was more than that. He was also their caretaker. Joseph's actions typified our treatment from God while we were sinners. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Romans 5, verse 6. Romans 5, verse 6. Or you can look at it up here on the board. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Uh, you could fill in there also. One would scarcely care about what happens to a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good one, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ is our example. And what he did for us when we were estranged from him, while we were sinners, while we were his enemies, he did the most, which was die for us. He died both spiritually on the cross and physically on the cross. And it was the spiritual death that brought our so great salvation. So this is an example. Of course, Joseph didn't know this verse. The verse hadn't been written yet. But this was what is in his soul. He's thinking about God and he's trying to please God. And God is our mentor. He is our example. Here's another one. Colossians 3, 12 through 13. Colossians 3, 12 through 13. And so as those who have been chosen of God, some uh, translation says have been elect of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. This is talking to who? Us. Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. I would submit to you, people cannot do that under their own power. Maybe at some times they can, but 
I would say most of the time, those qualities are produced by the Holy Spirit in the believer. Now, unbelievers can produce those same qualities. They may have those same qualities and ex exercise them from time to time. But it's not the same as a believer who is filled with the Holy Spirit because he has power that goes beyond our power. And many times when people do demonstrate these virtues, they have the wrong motive. Their motivation isn't what it should be. Verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And that means you should forgive them as well. It is hard to hang on to the ability to do this. In fact, it's impossible apart from the Holy Spirit's empowerment. When we live in a society where it's a dog-eat-dog -dog and you don't care about anyone else and you are numero uno, God isn't even on your radar. That describes most people. Okay, back to our verse now. Why are your faces so sad today? Verse 8. Then they said to him, we have, we have had a dream and there is no one to interpret it. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. First of all, the phrase, no one to interpret it. Now in Egypt, they had professional dream interpreters. They were, that was their, all their day job. I mean, that was their job every day. They were in the court, and their job was when someone had a dream to interpret it. Of course, it was all baloney because of what Joseph just said. He was not, he wasn't gentle necessarily in saying this. He was really, I think, asserting, uh, this in a dogmatic way. It was kind of like they were, feeling sorry for themselves, they had this dream and, and they were all in a, a discombobulated state, they didn't know what it meant, and there were no dream interpreters like they had in Egypt when they were, well, they were still in Egypt, but they were in jail, so they didn't have access to these professional dream interpreters. And so, <laughs> Joseph just blurts out, do not interpretations belong to God? Like, don't you know that? He is already giving credit to God before he even starts to interpret it. And then he says, tell it to me, and then look, please. He is polite. Now, we're not told what Joseph's mental attitude was in all this. Uh, but we do know that he was an un unusual person. And it wasn't just because he was an unusual person. It also has to do with the fact that he rose to the occasion under super testing. Verse 9. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, there was a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches, and as it was budding, its blossoms came out, and its clusters produced ripe grapes. Now, the number three in there is important. You'll notice you might underline three. The vine, there was three branches, and then he gave three, three more details. It was budding. Its blossom came out. That's number two. And clusters produced ripe grapes. Three. Now, Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup. And I put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. 
Then Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office and you will be put you will put Pharaoh's cup into his hand according to your former custom when you were his cupbearer. Now, I want you to underline the phrase, we'll lift up your head. That's kind of an idiomatic phrase. It means to summon. He will summon you. doesn't mean that he's going to cut his head off. But don't laugh at that because that's what's going to happen to the baker. Within three more days, Pharaoh essentially will summon you and restore you to your office and so forth. Verse 14. Only keep me in mind when it goes well with you and please, there he is, very polite always, do me a kindness by mentioning to Pharaoh and get me out of this house, get me out of this prison. Now I want to there's something here you need to understand. He wasn't begging for this person to do it. It was just natural for him to say that when you get out and we're restored, remember that I re interpreted your dream, and you can tell that to Pharaoh. And this was not an unreasonable request because most professional dream interpreters were paid. He didn't ask for any money. He could have. They probably couldn't give, it, give him money then, but when they got out, they could pay him. But all he wanted to do was to have him remind Pharaoh that he was there. And he goes on to explain a little more. For I was, in fact, kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing that would have put me into the dungeon. You know, he added that part because he, the guy needed to know that. Pharaoh would think, well, why should I be interested in somebody that's a criminal? Well, he's not a criminal. He, he point, pointed that out also. And his question also showed um, uh, his, how confident he was that this dream was interpreted correctly by God, and he was just the mouthpiece. Verse eight, uh, 16. When the chief baker saw that he had interpreted favorably, he was over there watching this. He's and he, he got a favorable response. He said to Joseph, I also saw my dream, and behold, there were three baskets of white bread on my head. Here we go with the threes again. And the reason that these three is again, because it's talking about in three days from the time that he interpreted his dreams, Pharaoh was going to have a big birthday, and he was going to summon them. So he said, and behold, there were three baskets of white bread on my head, and in the top basket there were some of all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, and the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. Now, this is showing that the baker, one of his jobs, of course, was to make sure that nobody tried to poison the food. The cupbearer, who was also an usher, his job was, of course, to make sure that no one poisoned his drink. And in the verse 17, it says, And in the top of the basket there were some all of all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, and the birds were eating it out of the basket. That was a tantamount to him not doing a good job of making sure that Pharaoh was protected from... Uh, from poison. I mean, the birds, he didn't, in the dream, he didn't shoo the birds away or anything. So this was pointing to the fact he didn't do a very good job and Pharaoh was really angry with him. Verse 18. Then Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you. Underline that. It sounds very much like the other one, but notice it says, he will lift up your head from you, from your body. He's going to be decapitated. Thus, it came about on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast. 
Oh, wait, I had a little bit more in verse 19. I'll, get, I'll do verse 19 again. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and will hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh off of you. That was not what the baker was expecting, I don't believe. Verse 20. Thus it came about on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all of his servants, and he lifted up the head of his chief cupbearer and the head of his chief baker among his servants. Now, again, you have that. That is the same word that was used earlier, and it refers to a summon, because both the cupbearer and the baker were summoned. But the cupbearer did not lose his head, <laughs> literally. Verse 21. And he restored the chief cupbearer to his office, and he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Look at verse 22. But he hanged Pharaoh, hanging the baker, just as Joseph had interpreted to him, to them. Now verse 23. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. The rest of this message is going to be about that verse. All of us have, all of us have had disappointments, trials and tribulations. Joseph had great hope that the Lord was going to get him out. You aren't supposed to be seeing this part. I've got to make it bigger here. Okay. All of us at one time or another have passionately hoped for something that did not come to pass. We felt devastated, shattered, distraught, and didn't know how we could carry on with our lives. Isn't that true? All of us have been at that point. This time, when it is, this is the time it is very easy to lose hope and to succumb to self-pity, anger, fear, resentment, bitterness, whining, and complaining. That is the norm of what happens when people's dreams and what they have been hoping for are shattered. Some people become introverts and never get over their disappointment. They live in continuous misery because of what could have been, but never will be. That's what they think in their lives. I can't move forward. Woe is me. I, I wholly and entirely was hoping that this would happen, and now it was dashed. Now all the great things that could have happened for me are not going to happen. That's what human people, or human viewpoint is in people. It's been in us from time to time. They think in terms of poor, pitiful me. The people need to recognize the following. One, they themselves are their own worst enemy. All of us have been there. They are themse they themselves their own worst enemy. Two, they only think about themselves. The reason they're so miserable is because they can't think about somebody else's problem because they are absorbed with self. And the self isn't where they want to be. It's not a happy self. Three, they act like children who pout when they don't get their way. There's, that's what children do. You, you've seen them. I want a piece of cake. No. What, is that, what happens to that bottom lip? They shoot that bottom lip out. It works. They don't, they don't have the words, but they have the body language. Four. They are swallowed up with self-pity and often seek pity from others. You ever have a friend when something happens and that's all they think about. And every time you see them, they're just dragging. And it, well, they have self-pity, and they want you to 
join the pity party. Five, they do not trust God and may resent him because they blame him for ruining their lives. If it's usually it's their own fault a lot of times that this happens, not always. But they want to blame somebody, so why not go right to the top? And they blame God, and they get bitter. Job 10.1 says, I loathe my own life, and I will give full vent to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. That is an honest person there. The only thing is most of the time the rest of us that are unfortunately around a person like that are the ones that get the brunt of their venting and complaint and their bitterness of soul. Husbands are specifically commanded not to be embittered against their wife. Colossians chapter 3 verse 19. Husbands... Love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Bitterness is a toxic, horrible mental attitude sin. And it usually means that you're holding a grudge. And when you're holding your, a grudge, who are you hurting? Yourself. You're not hurting the person that you have a grudge against. Sometimes they don't even know you have that grudge. You're dismantling yourself. You are putrefying in your soul. And that's point number eight. They act as if they know what the future holds in store for them, but only God knows that. You see, they think their future is doomed. What I really want, I want it so bad, so badly. And now it's not going to happen. And now I'm going to, Reconcile myself to be in mourning for the rest of my life. And a lot of different things can happen when, a, when someone loses a loved one. They can become embittered and think my life is over. I can't go forward. And they hate God. But they don't know the future. And they don't know God either. They are not happy and are not content until they have made others unhappy because if they aren't happy, no one can be happy. They just, I've, I've got somebody in my mind, not a, I don't even remember their name, but I, you've been around people who, everybody, it's a good day, the sun is shining, everything, and this person walks in that's bitter. You know, like Richard Nixon, remember? His face he made. And it, everything just brings down. And you start talking to him and you try to say, Hey, uh, how you doing? It's a wonderful day, isn't it? <clears throat> just grunts, growls. And they will bring you down if you let them. I can tell by your faces you know what you, you, you've been here. And if it's a member of your family... That cannot abide. You have to stamp that out or they will poison the entire family. It has to be dealt with. And the father is the one to make sure that it is. Hebrews 12, 15 says, See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, by it many be defiled. It's contagious, this bitterness, this toxicity. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31, that all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Now I have a little Definition at the end of malice. Most people don't know what malice is. It's not a term that we use. When was the last time in the normal course of a conversation you heard malice? Sometimes it's used in the courtroom. It means to desire to cause pain or distress to another. And that's what bitter people do. 
it is their goal. If I have to be unhappy, if I have to be miserable, well, they're going to be miserable as well, and I'm going to see to it. That's how horrible bitterness is. And see, Joseph could have very easily, very easily been in the dumps waiting to hear from Pharaoh. And we know from that, by the way, verse 23 is the last verse in verse in chapter 40. And the first verse of chapter 41, we find out that he didn't hear from Pharaoh for two years. Two years. Okay, I'm going to blank this for just one second. Okay. Are you all ready for I need a drum roll. <laughs> there you go. This is very simple. And yet it is very profound. And I hope that you write it down because I wasn't going to have it in my PowerPoint. But then I thought, well, I better put it in there. And it's very short, very pithy. And I thought, I I'll go and put it in. I, went in. I started typing it and I forgot what it says. At least w one particular word that threw me off. So that's why I'm saying write it down because you're going to want to remember this, but make sure you're going to remember it by writing it down on something. Okay, are you ready? This should be the view of believers with regards to trials. Here it is. Well, you didn't see it. I got to go back. I didn't have it on. Okay, you ready? All this, now you're going to say, is that what he's talking about? Trials are food for faith to feed on. Trials are food for faith to feed on. That is a confident believer. That is a believer who is trusting on the Lord. You, if you say this thinking that you're the one that is going to feed on the trials, you don't get it. You can say trials are food for faith to feed on because it's God who enables you to gorge on trials. You could say trials are for faith rest to feed on. That would work as well, wouldn't it? Do you see the confidence there? And if you think that you are bragging because you're such a super saint, then you're really weak and arrogant. That's not what it's talking about. This is a something said because you're trusting in the Lord. And you are so confident when that trial comes along, that one that takes your, your breath away, that w when you are body slammed, it's nothing for God. It's nothing for the Holy Spirit. His power is going to feed on that trial and He's going to bring you through it. He's going to give you a way of escape. And on the other side, you're going to be stronger and you're going to be saying, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord. Okay. We'll move on. I hope you wrote it down. If you didn't, you're going to regret it. What should believers do when they are heartbroken when their hopes and dreams, <coughs> uh, well, I missed, when their hopes and dreams are shattered. Let me, I can't, I'll have to, if I click on this, it'll go to the next slide. I'll fix that later. So what should believers do when their heart is broken and their hopes and dreams are shattered? Point number one. Remember that God loves you and that he knows what the future will be and we don't. You speculate. God knows. And he allowed this thing to happen for your good. He's working behind the scenes. Two, acknowledge your sins to God. 1 John 1, 9. Well, you might say, well, what if I don't have any sins? <laughs> That's laughable. The rug is going to be pulled out from under you. You are undone. You are discombobulated. And you're not going to have any mental attitude sins. What are you, a super saint? You're going to have mental attitude sins. And we have to be right with God to get that out of the way. So we acknowledge our sins. And we have a whole parfait of mental attitude sins 
that we could dwell on. Three, pour out your soul to the Lord when you are disappointed, distressed, or discouraged. And we don't have time to go to Psalm 42 and 43. I wish we did. This was my, that would be, Psalm 42 would be the high part of my message today. But we'll go on through. There's only a couple more points. And if we have time, we'll come back and go as far as we can. Pour your soul out to the Lord when you are disappointed, distressed, or discouraged. That's what you, He wants you to do. He has the remedy. He has the power. Four. Thank the Lord for His grace, His love, help, for His promises, for the power to endure, and for His faithfulness. You, this is done when you have just had a tremendous loss. This is the time when you thank him for his grace, for his love, his help, for his promises, for the power to endure and for his faithfulness. His faithfulness is getting you through this ordeal. And here are three verses that are pertinent. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing but in all things, uh, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your problems be known to the Lord, and the, and the, let's see, what is it, and the, the, what, oh uh, yeah, the, and the peace of God uh, that is beyond understanding will, uh, Garner your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I hadn't said that in a while. Wow. And verse 13 in chapter 4. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Verse 13 of Philippians, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 has to do with none of us will be tested beyond what we're able to bear. Okay, we've got... If I had any sense, I would stop now. But I like to use every little moment. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 42. We'll probably only have time for the first verse. Now what this verse is, Psalm 42 and 43 really go together. And to put this first verse in context, it's... Well, let's read the first, the introduction. Psalm 42, for the choir director, a maskil of the sons of Korah. A maskil means a teaching or instructional psalm. Now, the, the setting of this is David was run out of Jerusalem by his son Absalom. Absalom uh, took over the throne and David had to flee for his life. And he's away from Jerusalem. He's away from all the people and the, the temple, the feast days, all the wonderful things that are there. And he's thinking about this. I think he was up around the Mount Hermon area up, uh, up in the north. And he started thinking of how much he missed these things. And he pours his soul out to the Lord. Remember I said that's what we do when these things happen. We pour our soul out to the Lord. And this is a description of how that takes place, at least it was for David. We'll look at verse 1. As a deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for thee, O God. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> that would be like there was a drought and a deer is so thirsty and he's panting and he goes and and takes his his nozzle and 
junks it in that water, in his cool water, and he drinks and he drinks and he drinks. That was the illustration that was used for what David was feeling like because he wanted to be with the Lord. He wanted to be with his fellow believers. He was used to all these things, and now he had been set apart from them, and he was panting for them. My soul pants for thee, O God. What a beautiful description. You know, it's unfortunate. I think sometimes, well, a lot of times, we take things for granted. We came here today, and this was a phenomenal church. I'm, I'm not talking about the building. We're proud of the building. But I'm talking about the believers, because every person here is not here to be entertained. You're not here to try to prove to other people how righteous you are, what a great Christian you are. You're hungry because you pant for God. You pant for the Word of God. You have to have it. It's like you're fixed on it. You're hooked on it. At least I hope I'm describing this congregation. I think I am rightly describing it. And if that was just taken away, if you were away from Country Bible Church, let's say for two years. Wouldn't you miss it? Wouldn't you miss the like-minded people and the fellowship, the Word being taught? Wouldn't your soul just hunger for these things? And what makes this church different than most is they don't miss the entertainment. What they miss is their souls being fed by the Word of God. And they, every, every time you come to church and you hear the Bible given through expositional teaching, which is the way that I teach, verse by verse, sometimes word by word, it fills you up. It is your power. It is your strength. It is your connection with the Lord. And when you leave these double doors here or over here, and you leave this church, you take all that with you. You know, a lot, it's unfortunate. I, I was in a particular denominational church for a long time, and we had, well, it wasn't an hour, we got maybe a 30-minute message. And before I got out of the church, by the time I got in the, in the parking lot, and someone said, well, what did you learn today? I couldn't think of a thing, nothing. It was like I put my time in, make sure you mark the box. I did, my, I did my bit. Listen, if any of you are coming here for that reason, it would make me want to cry. Not because I'm special, and not because these people are special, they are, because God is so special, and you're going to miss out. You're just going through life Missing out on the most important things. And it's so unfortunate. How many people are in churches today want to make sure that the box was checked? And they don't know what they're missing. They don't know what's available. And so that's one reason we should have Thanksgiving. And we don't know when the next horrible thing is going to discourage us and just take the wind out of our sails. God is right there. And it's for a reason. I think one of the hardest things for us to face is when you lose a loved one. And we all have lo lost loved ones. And it's just, it's a horrible place to be. And yet, yet God sees us through it to the point to where we can say that trials are food for our faith to feed on. And that's only possible because of our great loving God and His power and who He is. I'm so thankful for you. I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for the positive volition that you all have. It's the most attractive thing about you. 
and it's the most attractive thing about me. And when you're around like-minded believers who are hungry for the word, you just love them all the more. We don't call each other brothers and sisters. I guess because I was in the Baptist church, I thought it was phony, and I thought I'm never going to have that in my church. But we are brothers and sisters in the Lord. And if you are growing the way that God expects you to, you will be closer to the people in this church and other believers who are positive and hungry for his word than even your blood kin. And we have an esprit de corps. We are the royal family. And we can't allow disappointments and discouragement to get us into bitterness because bitterness will kill you. Spiritually. So we rise up a, a praise to our God. He is always there. Now, He is not going to claim that you're not going to have any disappointments, nor would I, nor would anybody who has any sense. Because we live in the devil's world and things we're going to lose things, things we passionately want to happen. For some teenagers, it might their heart was set since they were a little girl or a little boy to go to a certain college and they can't get in or to go to a particular uh, job, a profession or something, and they don't make it. Somebody might have aspirations to be a great golfer or a great basketball player, and they stink. They're horrible. It won't happen. But we don't have to get bittered and, and let this get us down. Two years is a long time, and that's how long... Joseph had to wait. And knowing Joseph, one of the, remember, one of the things that we'll, we need to do to not get into the doldrums, he was thinking about other people. He was thinking and helping other people. And when you're doing that, you're not going to be all morose and just focused on yourself. When you help other people, you forget self. And that's where joy is. And that's where we want to be. Well, I'm out of time. We'll pick this up next time and we're going to finish Psalm 42. Beautiful psalm. Gives us in a vivid way how we pour out our soul to God. That's what he wants. The last portion of this service is dedicated to those who don't know what's going to happen when they breathe their last. What's going to happen to you? Are you just going to become worm bait? Or are you going to Go to the smoking or non-smoking place. Well, of course, everyone wants to go to the non-smoking. Even smokers want to go there. But not many people know how to get there. They think they have to work the way. They have to really impress God, and then they'll get into the non-smoking part. Well, the good news is that Jesus Christ took care of that whole issue. He is the Son of God, and he was perfect. He never sinned. He went to the cross. He died on the cross. He rose from the cross after he was buried, of course. And then now he offers something that is priceless, eternal life. Eternal life is offered to anyone who will trust Jesus Christ and his work on the cross and nothing else. It's given as a gift. You can't earn it. And you can have that right now today. This very moment, you can make a decision. Am I going to trust on my own works, which God calls filthy rags, or am I going to trust in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross? And the moment that you say, I think I'm going to go there. In that moment, you're born again. You are a member of the royal family, the most high. Your ticket to heaven is guaranteed. You have the possibility of living the abundant life. I'm not talking about bank accounts. I'm talking about your closeness to the creator of this universe. You can settle it. You might think it's too easy, but it's grace. It wasn't easy for God to provide, but it's easy for us to accept it as a gift. Now, Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word, and it's the rock on which we stand. We can't wait till we can see 
the living word. And in the meantime, we're going to continue to grow in grace and knowledge. And when we get the air let out of our tires, when we just get so discouraged and so disparaging, you are there. You will lift us up. And we're so thankful for that because of your phenomenal love. And we pray that we will meditate on these things and be ready to help others when they're discouraged. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. How you doing, John? Good to see you. Make that old long drive this morning?